You're listening to Patriarch, the retelling of the biblical story of Abraham by me, Colin Piper. Uh, If you've managed to wade your way through six chapters to this point, I'm guessing you're enjoying it. And uh, if you are, please do tell others about it. It is a completely free resource. We just want as many people as possible to be impacted by this amazing story uh, of Abraham. So do share the Facebook page or any way you can, just talk about it with friends and let's see how many people we can bless through it. Uh, as I say, it is a free resource. However, on the website, there are ministries that Melissa and I love. And uh, if, if you're appreciative, we'd be grateful if you could find ways of supporting these dear, dear friends around the world who are making all sorts of sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. Go to BibleNovels.com and uh, you can find out more. Anyway, we're about to find out what happens when a dysfunctional family meets for a party. Patriarch, Chapter 7, Part 1. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded, and the child grew up and was weaned. In any ordinary family, the end of the precarious journey through infancy was a rightful course of celebration. But for this elderly couple who had invested everything in this one child, the celebration was understandably on a particularly grand scale. Sarah was happy to take on the planning of the great feast, and for his part, Abraham was happy to leave her to it. Later, when at his lowest, he was to wonder whether he should have gotten more involved. Then maybe he could have foreseen and avoided some of the unhappy events for which this feast would forever be remembered, and their catastrophic consequences. At the time, though, he had just wanted to enjoy the time and space he had craved and carved out. Abraham had settled in the desert, and had slowly moved his wealth down from Mamre to a place where two ravines meet. In the rainy season, these ravines, or wadis, became channels of water which kept the area surprisingly fertile for a desert region. At other times of year, they dried up and were adopted as roads by travellers and traders, either on the east-west trail from Edom to Ashkedod or, less frequently, from Kiriath Arba in the north to the Negev in the south. He was also pleased to find that the water was plentiful, even when the wadis did dry up. He discovered that a short dig down of around 15 to 20 feet, and there would be clay. This meant that the water which sunk into the hills to the north had nowhere to go but to form small subterranean lakes beneath his very feet. All this meant he was able to enjoy in some comfort the space and peace of the deserts while still only 30 miles from the only other place he felt at home, Mamre. Consequently, Abraham wasted no time, but dug a well and settled by it. In fact, in many ways, these last three years had been the most settled of his life. The year leading up to Isaac's birth had been a traumatic one. First there was the horror of the destruction of Sodom and and then the humiliation of his failure in Gerar. Both had shaken his faith and relationships to the very core. However, on leaving Gerar, he'd begun to rediscover his faith and then the birth of Isaac had restored it all the more. Still, though, something held him back. But all the same, last three years in the desert had been spent in something of a spiritual oasis as much as a physical one. But it hadn't all been good. On leaving Gerar, he had been reunited with Sarah, and then the birth of Isaac had restored something of the bond between them, but still they had subsequently managed to drift apart again. However understandable the reasons may have been, it still saddened Abraham that they who had once been so close through the toughest of times, had now become strangers when their dreams had come true. He blamed himself. And three years of reflection only reinforced his opinion 
What's more, he simply didn't know what to do about it. Of course, on the one hand, he didn't need to do anything. Sarah was, after all, a chattel, and he owed her nothing. But on the other hand, of course, she was, or, or at least had been, so, so much more than that. And in any case, he could never view her this way. She had her own opinion, and had a habit of getting her own way. Formerly, this was because Abraham trusted her judgment. These days, however, he was less inclined to trust her, and sometimes her judgment actually bothered him. But still he gave way, probably more out of guilt than conviction. Sarah, though, was determined to get her way on one thing in particular. In her mind... It wasn't just her way, it was God's way, and therefore it was the right way. All her planning for the big day had one purpose in mind. At the weaning celebration, the rightful order of things would be affirmed forever. Oh, the celebration. (laughs) Abraham hadn't been looking forward to it. Not that he wasn't grateful, he sincerely was. Isaac meant so much to him, and to see the toddler not just alive but well was something for which he daily gave thanks to God. But he rarely enjoyed feasts, particularly when it involved gathering his small but disparate family. Rarely could so few people have had so varied outlooks and dispositions, and his foreboding about the day increased as it drew nearer. But all the same, he still managed to be shocked by what happened when it arrived. The first surprise wasn't a bad one. The scale of the event became ever clearer as the feast day drew nearer. Abraham wasn't surprised, but didn't in any way begrudge the extravagance. He could afford it, (laughs) and he wasn't likely to hold such a feast again. He was truly grateful to his God and was happy to share this gratitude with his household. The second surprise, though, was disturbing. A couple of days before the feast, Eliezer escorted Lot's daughters into his camp. Lot himself had apparently been unwilling to leave what he viewed as the safety of the mountains. The women, though, had no such qualms. And in any case, they had reasons of their own to celebrate Abraham had heard of their supposed blessing, although what his trusted chief herdsman had told him disturbed him greatly. The first shock was seeing the women again. He hardly knew them, and what he did know of them he didn't like. But all the same, when he saw them, he was at first horrified, and then, despite himself, almost immediately pitying. They were old, well beyond their years, and almost repulsive to look at. Their dirt-caked hair was grey at the root, and their faces drawn grotesquely. Their skin was leathery, and their stance stooped. Worse than their appearance, though, was their aroma. But there was worse yet. The next shock was seeing the children the women carried. They were not attractive babies. But then, based on what Eliezer had intimated, that was hardly a surprise. Yet that wasn't what disturbed Abraham. There was something about the pair which caused a disquiet in his spirit. He couldn't reasonably or rationally explain it. All he knew was that it's each woman uh, prepared to present her child to him. He felt a distinct unease and then a dark sense of foreboding. The greatest shock came when the women stood their boys before him for him to bless them. Each announced the name of her own son and neither saw any need to hide his origin. Moab spat out the first defiantly. Ben Ami purred the younger proudly. Abraham could feel the sickness rise in his throat. It wasn't what they had done which sickened him, but the fact they were so hardened to it they could call their children from the father 
and son of my people. It repulsed him and it angered him that this was the only mention, however oblique and indirect, that either made to their father, Lot. Suddenly the memories of that fateful judgment day flooded back, but now he wondered whether the destruction should have been greater. Who knew what evil would be the issue of these children? And he avoided them for the rest of their stay. Abraham, however, did notice that they were not totally deprived of attention. One family member gave them an almost unnatural level of attention, unnatural for any 17-year-old boy to give to three-year-old toddlers, for goodness sake, but particularly for this youth to give to any member at all of his family. It was as though Ishmael knew an affinity with these wretches. And again, Abraham was disturbed by the thought. So Abraham was relieved when the day of the feast dawned, although he now very much feared what he might bring. Secretly, he looked forward to the dawning of the day after the feast when life could return to some normality. And yet, despite himself and the rather unpleasant aspects of some of the company, he did find himself warming to the occasion. It was, after all, a celebration of the gift and faithfulness of God. Then again, the aromas of cooking meats and bread aroused his senses and soothed his mood, and the anticipation not only of good food, but also the fine wines recently purchased from passing traders distracted him from all that had disturbed him so far. In fact, he was growing impatient with the wait, and the heat only made him more irritable. The long three-sided tent in which the party lounged both shaded them from the sun and allowed them to be cooled by the breeze. But they still began to sweat and feel very uncomfortable in their finery. It wasn't, however, the food they waited for, but the cause of the celebration himself, the infant Isaac. And his delay was meticulously planned, along with all else which took place that day, the coordinator had left nothing to chance. With a deft touch, she'd arranged everything for maximum effect, and everything went just as she had hoped, if not better. Even those responses over which she had less control. The response to the arrival of Isaac was crucial to all Sarah's plans. And as she presented the child, she was reassured and delighted by the involuntarily sharp intake of breath all around her. Most of the family and friends were impressed, and, well, they might be. Isaac was dressed in the finest of robes, which she had personally laboured over for the last couple of years. Everything about them was the best anyone had ever seen. But then Sarah had figured that this was only right for one who was symbolically claiming a birthright greater than anyone present could ever comprehend. Not all the family, though, were impressed. Yet it was the negative reaction of those who weren't which delighted Sarah the most. She needed more of a reaction yet, though, and waited patiently like a hunter waits for a circling animal to close in on the carefully laid bait. She couldn't afford to strike too soon and miss out on the kill. She would never get this sort of opportunity again. She drew the introduction out, much to the delight of most and the fury of two. Never once did she look the way of either of the angered pair. But she could sense the rage rising, and you sooner rather than later it would express itself. She wasn't completely sure just how it would do so. Oh, but she was ready. And willing to wait for it however long it took. Slowly, 
Sarah proceeded to take the infant down the line with the appreciative reclined guests. She was delighted to see that the attention of the whole company focused not only on the child but also upon the reaction of those to whom he was introduced. Each expressed again and again the delight of the whole company and in so doing could prolong the joy of the moment that little bit longer. But then a little to her right. Sarah heard a sneer. It was so quiet it was probably missed by all except those who were listening for it, which actually was no one except Sarah. The hunter's heart raced. It still wasn't yet enough, she knew that, but it was evidence that the prey was taking the bait. She ignored it and carried on down the line of men reclined at the main table while the women looked on. This cultural split of the sexes actually suited Sarah's purposes perfectly. It meant that the donkey wouldn't have his mother to control him. Ishmael's actual mocking reaction to the child held before him may have in other contexts been construed as funny or at worst puerile, inappropriate or insensitive. And even in this context it probably would have been glossed over and forgotten. Ordinarily he might have been the recipient of some nasty or disgusted looks followed by rebukes later that evening. Oh but Sarah wasn't prepared to let Ishmael off quite so easily. In fact, her response was so fierce and so overwhelmingly shocking that it obliterated the memory of the original offence. All anyone could say later was that whatever Ishmael had said or done must have been utterly vile to provoke such a vehement response from someone who had up until then been so tranquil and joyful. Like the undertow of a great wave drains a beach of water before flooding it. So Sarah's face was first drained of all colour before being flooded in the deepest red rage. She began to tremble violently, causing the assembled company to fear not just for Sarah but for themselves too. They had no idea what was happening or what was about to happen. At first she stood staring at Ishmael. But when he sneered in a pathetic pretense of nonchalance, she immediately swung her attention and wrath around to Abraham at the head of the table. It was the venom behind the words which shocked as much as that message. Get rid of that slave woman and her son, she spat out. For that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. It had happened all so quickly that no one would have guessed the words that were years in the crafting. Over that time, Hagar and Ishmael had in Sarah's mind been reduced to nameless slaves. They were no longer people. They were things. They had no identity except in each other and no one owed them anything. They had no right to be there or indeed any rights at all. They were imposters who'd wormed their way into a royal line like parasites. They were no bodies before the likes of her son Isaac. And on this day, when he would claim his birthright and inheritance, no other pretender was permitted. They had to go. Abraham, though, couldn't so easily depersonalise and demonise Ishmael and Hagar. Ishmael was his son. But it had all happened so quickly and he was unprepared. He had no response, prepared or spontaneous. He just sat there, the mighty patriarch with nothing to say, no words of wisdom, reconciliation or reason. Sarah's venom had struck him and he was numb. For a long time, unable even to move. Then, as the poison of the words began to penetrate, he began to feel the pain. Still, though, he couldn't respond. And finally, all he could do was get up and leave. In many ways, he was running away again, but he was not of the age to run. 
his slow, sad and silent departure merely added to the awkward tension which now gripped the whole company, all of whom wished to leave too. Eventually they did so. Slowly and respectfully, but at the same time as quickly as they could. Abraham was a broken man. This was supposed to be a day of celebration, but instead it had turned into a day of deep sadness. His family would forever be fragmented, although the extent of the breakdown even he couldn't say. He wished he could speak with authority, but couldn't. He carried too much guilt before Sarah, and perhaps still before God too. He really had no idea. In finding space from Sarah, he did come before his God in brokenness like never before, and cried tears of regret, of pain, of confusion, of fear. He cried from the bottom of his heart and soul and in so doing, bared them before his Lord. For the first time since that fateful night above Sodom and Gomorrah, God spoke to Abraham tenderly like never before. Words of comfort, father to son, and father to father. Do not be so distressed about the boy and his maidservant. Abraham wanted to protest that they had names. They were known to him, if not to God. But he didn't have time before the Lord continued. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. In his confusion, Abraham had found himself getting angry with Sarah, whose reaction had caused all this. In telling him to get rid of mother and son, she was basically telling him to divorce Hagar, which, given the nature of their relationship, wasn't particularly hard or meaningful, but she was also asking him to disinherit his son, and that was unthinkable. However Ishmael may have been conceived, he was his blood. And yet God was now saying she was right? Again he felt his anger rising. Because it is through Isaac that your offering offspring will be reckoned. Abraham knew that. He knew it. The Lord had said it. But Ishmael was his son too. Again, though, there was no time for protests and ultimately no reason for them either. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also. Ah, the Lord did care. Because he is your offspring. The Father did understand. You're listening to Patriarch the Podcast. For more information, you can go to BibleNovels.com where you can become a Patreon supporter to support those working with young people across the world.